So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, we are here with Dr. Omar again, and uh, today I want to talk about, just from the offset, the relationship between uh, Zionism and Freemasons and Jesuits. How did all these different relationships work with each other? How does Zionism, and, and how does this all fall into what we will call the New World Order? Okay. Uh, this uh, New World Order is actually an ancient uh, prophecy that uh, proceeded from um, uh, or one of the um, one of the realms, uh, the temples of the goddesses. I've forgotten now uh, which one. But they prophesied a New World Order, which was the um, reinstatement of the rule of Saturn. Okay. Now, Saturn refers obviously to uh, some sort of Iblisian influence, whatever that myth involves. And it's really, it's not worthwhile going into this mythology because uh, they're all pretty much the same. Okay? okay, you've got a father of God, you've got a son of God, you've got a wife of God, you've got children of God, you've got uncles and relatives, and they're all involved in all sorts of nasty schemes with each other. Mm -hmm. or Control and power and manipulation of their um, of, of the pawns who serve them, hmm. meaning us. Right. Okay. And you have people now at the top of the pyramid who consider themselves the Olympians, and actually, the secret services call them Olympians. Hmm. There are groups of families at the top that have been described by several uh, writers mm -hmm. as the untouchables, mm -hmm. okay? And the secret services call them Olympians. They're absolutely out of touch with reality. At our level, they don't care about the, the people other than, uh, the, other than uh, to service their needs, okay? They're expendable. Anyone is expendable beneath their level, okay? And yes. even even they are expendable in the eyes of Evists, of course. Right. Who doesn't right. love any of them, yet he allows them to, to believe that uh, they're his favorites. Okay? Yeah. And some of them enter this delusion and uh, think that they're the blue-blooded nobility of the, the best of the best, if you will. So all of that is a bunch of nonsense, which is an old world order, which is a new world order. So somewhere in the past, there was some sort of warfare that you, you it was alluded to in the Lord of the Rings. There, there was an overturning of a rulership in which men lost his position. This golden age passed away and, and, uh, uh, Satan, if this is trying to, um, attribute this loss to himself as the righteous ruler, hmm. okay? So, but when, when they talk about the, the restoration of order, the new world order, they're talking about restoring him to the throne. And there's a further restitution to take place that they want to restore him to his proper place in heaven, hmm. from which he's been cast out, okay? And we know the heavens are now closed to him. Uh, Isa spoke of this, and um, uh, the prophet certainly spoke about this. Mm -hmm. The Quran makes that very clear. Yeah. So, now these people are pretending a spiritual authority and a an occult network that uh, storms heaven, grabs the secrets, and allows them to be the rulers, the gods, if you will. So, the secret service calls them the Olympians, and probably with good reason, because they probably do have uh, rather uh, dangerous occult powers hmm. at the hand of the various jinn, which at that level are not your ordinary jinn. Right, okay? right. But, you know, there, there are several layers of jinn. I'm no jinn expert. Uh, I've had some experience with them, but I'm no jinn expert. They, hmm. There's the hierarchy of jinn. Okay. Yeah, they definitely. They have their own kingdom, they have their own rules, they have their own authority, their own powers and principalities, as Paul and the other uh, uh, apostles.
Moses wrote of in the New Testament. So these things are real, these creatures are real. The secret services who guard them know that they are real, mm -hmm. and that's why they call them the untouchable Olympians. You don't touch these people. And that's in, that's in keeping with the curse that placed on Crane you read Kabil. You remember Kabil yes. had this conversation uh, with Allah after his crime against heaven and uh, his brother. And uh, in in Genesis it says, uh, "Oh, if you cast me out, then uh, men are going to want to kill me." And he said, "No, I'll put my mark on you and make them afraid of you. They will fear to kill you." Okay. So this is what we're talking about here. That mark at that level is very very clear. Mm. To, to those people, which is why uh, you see at the upper levels of the pyramid, there's such strict obedience. The people at those levels, just below the upper level of the pyramid, the, the golden triangle at the top, yeah. they're afraid for their lives mm. and the lives of their family. They're, they're living in fear. So whatever they're told, they do. They do. Because otherwise, something absolutely terrible and horrible beyond our imagination will happen to them. Mm -hmm. And they're aware of this because they have witnessed it. Okay, They have witnessed it in their occult circles. So that is the essence of the leadership at the, uh, at the top of the pyramid. Now, the problem is that those below, as we descend the levels of the pyramid we get into the this uh this uh, be as you move forward let me um share with you a video that i'd okay. like you to comment on that has to do with uh this kind of like relationship that you're talking about so uh just let me share this video with you okay and then i want you to okay. watch it and then tell me what you take from it what do you see okay. from it hold on one second so, it, so this it's is documented it, a lot even in hip hop music by selling the souls and you know. For, uh, this is an interview, uh, the vigilant one he did with mm -hmm. me. I just want to show you a small, like two three minute clip of that. So here it comes. Okay. Okay. Uh, numerous, numerous people have spoken about selling the souls and making deals with the devil. <laughs> very interesting that you said that they're scared for this you know, their life because this gentleman that just spoke really looks like he's scared you know yeah, Bob Dylan, yeah. Uh, and others yeah and they, they make these packs okay uh, this is real is there more you want to show me I can show you one more that's pretty interesting and it's from this uh -huh. rapper uh, Let me just forward this a little bit. So he starts off saying, "Okay." So basically, what, what, what's your question here? Uh, I'm familiar with these. I've seen some of these testimonies. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, so uh, basically, the idea is that uh, this is really happening, right? And so, are these? How are these people approached? How do they get recruited? How do they become part of this? And then, how how do they get their orders? And 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 uh, you know, and how much does it corrupt their fitra? Like you were in the Freemasons, so how much does it begin to corrupt? Is this something that does corrupt the fitra? Or it doesn't. Yes, it does. It does. And uh, but the, the individual involved has 
has the choice, has the choice of uh, allowing it to corrupt. Now, first, before we proceed with any and my response, which I really don't know what's going to be because uh, often I start to open my mouth and it just flows. Um, you cannot sell your soul to the devil. Okay, you, it, this is a false concept, but you can make, be made to believe that you've done it. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay, so, so that is what's taking place. Many of these people actually believe that they have done it. They enter into a covenant. They actually sign in blood, sometimes their own blood, sometimes in the blood of a sacrificial victim. It depends on the nature of the covenant and what is expected, okay, of them. So they do these things. This is admitted. Um, and uh, this is also in the literature of the, the occult literature. It's described. This is not something that is a game. The police don't want to talk about it, but you, um, you, if you get them alone, some of the police at the lower levels, not at the upper levels, most of them are Satanists. They will not discuss these matters, which is why they are always covered up. Mm -hmm. And But the lower level police, some of the detectives, some of them who have gone rogue, for example, there's a New York detective who's gone rogue, searching out the pedo pedophiles, for example, he describes these things. They all describe these things. They describe the satanic episodes. They are FBI agents of on of good repute who've gone into this and lost the lost their reputation, lost their position because of their exposés here mm. in this field. So what happens is that these stars, no matter who they are, whether they be pop artists or movie stars or whatever the case might be, politicians, CEOs, they enter into a covenant and they are made to believe that their soul is unrecoverable, that they've mm. sold it, okay? Of course, the soul belongs to Allah. It doesn't even belong to us. It is ours as long as Allah wishes it to be ours, you see? I wish every person of the occult would just listen to that message right there. Oh, it, yeah. it, you know, yeah, they, they've they, sold their soul, realizing it wasn't theirs to sell. <laughs> you yeah, know, it wasn't. It wasn't in, a, order, in order to recover uh, the, the, from this, they may lose their life, but they will not lose their soul. Hmm. Allah is all merciful and all forgiving. Yeah, uh, the only thing He doesn't forgive is blasphemy. Hmm. Okay, and one has to continue in that. You have to actually continue in the blasphemy up until the point of death without repentance. Mm -hmm. And that cannot be uh, forgiven. So these people enter into these covenants and then they are kept in tow. They stay on the square in the Freemasonic term. They are kept in line through fear mm -hmm. and through fear of losing their position. But most of them, uh, they they push this fear back. It becomes a thing of uh, uh, a subliminal uh, forgetfulness, okay? Because they then preoccupy themselves with the life, mm. la, the, la vida, la roca, okay? They're living this life. The mafia does the same thing. Hey, I'm living the life, buddy, mm. you know. Uh, I'm, you know, they're in the flow. They're, they're, they're doing whatever they do. They get involved in the sex and the drugs and the alcohol and the power and the the esteem that they get. Even academics do. You know, these academics that are forever on the uh, uh, global excursion, going from one conference to another, never accomplishing anything, mm -hmm. but always getting acclamation. Right. Look at now 60 years of the IOK movement. What do we have, what do we have to show for it? We're doing more <laughs> in these few in, from, in, in these few interviews than they have done in sixty years. Hmm. You understand? Yeah. This is what really needs to be done. What they are doing is perpetuating the sin of pride. They are enjoying the, uh, uh, the the fame and the fortune. Okay, because fortune comes along with it. So that's what these people do. 
Now, how are they controlled? The fear, but they're controlled mostly. That's very interesting by because the Quran mentions the fear tactic with magic over and over again. Yes. When Prophet Musa is confronted with the magicians, the, the, over and over again, Allah says, وَلَا تَخَفْ إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ لَعَنَا oh, Don't fear. Example there, yeah. You know, and then over and over again, Quran says that, you know, shaitan will tell you, you make you fear poverty, the Quran mentions, right? So it's like a, it's like a yes. constant tactic of shaitan. And, and, and I guess when the world is in a state of fear, then that's like a, a pretty big sign that something devilish is yeah. going on. You know? Of course it is. Of course it is, yes. Because there's only one that we should fear, and that is the wrath of Allah. We should fear the loss of His favor, the loss of His grace, mm -hmm. and especially the eternal loss of that favor. These people are fearing the wrong entity. <laughs> mm. They're fearing, uh, and they're fearing the loss of their own position, and this own position is temporal. This is just a, a, a trial. All, the, all that we confront here on earth is a trial. It's a trial of what? Faith. Iman. Mm. That's all it is. It's a trial of faith. I had a conversation with my eldest son years and years ago about this. And after about 40 minutes, he said, So, Dad, what you're telling me, that this is just a test? <laughs> 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 yes, he got it. Okay. Mm. All is just a test, and people forget that. They, they they tend to live in this realm where they're in the zone of their fame, and the devil plays on this. And the moment that they slip, he says, look, if you don't do what you're told, you're going to lose that contract, or I'm going to call in my, 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 my loan, mm -hmm. okay? And you're going to lose everything. Not only that, but if the person's important enough, if they're a whistleblower, they may lose their life, or they may be used to set an example and put into prison, okay, for the rest of their lives. So that other people who are also under that same thumb don't rebel, okay? Okay. So when, I, and they use, and the devil will use this example, his Warlocks, his witches, will use this example over and over again to keep their people in line. Hmm. Okay, and it's real; it's very real. And often they will they will kill someone in your family just to keep you in line hmm. if you're important enough. Okay, so these people are living in fear, and that fear is real. And in order to overcome that uh, terror. They turn to drugs, or they turn to women, they turn to sex, they turn to, you know, whatever it is that they might turn to. Mm. Other people, uh, you know, who are not so important, they just enjoy, as I said, they enjoy the fame. So, um, you, you take, you take certain people who are preaching a certain style that is keeping the Ummah in ignorance, as we've said, the devil will let them run. You see, they won't even know that they're being manipulated. Yeah. You see, they'll get funds, they'll get uh, fame, they'll get fortune, uh, they'll get favor with all kinds of people. Doors will open for them, and they have no idea who is unlocking those doors, mm. who is opening those doors, and they won't know until the death angel confronts them. You see. This is, unless, unless Allah in His mercy, uh, tries to, you know, pinch them, <laughs> to wake them up. Okay. So, as you move down the pyramid, people and people, people are more and more in that particular condign control. That's what it's called politic in political science. It's called condign control. It's reward and punishment. Hmm. Okay. Okay. It, it's very simple psychology. Yeah. So you, you tell the line, you do as you're told, you follow orders, you are rewarded like a good dog. Mm -hmm. see? And those who serve, who actually serve the satanic temples as like altar boys, you know, an altar girl, they're actually called dogs by oh. the, uh, the warlocks and the priestesses. They're called dogs. And you see this now in the sexological sphere. 
you see people out on the streets now uh, walking their lover in a sadomasochistic uh, relationship. Right, right, right. The sadist will be walking the dog. The masochist will be on all fours with a chain and collar. Right. Okay. Well, they're open in public. Okay. This is not taking place. This is what it is. Okay. And people now, they go along with this. So, but let's return to your initial question having to do with the relationship between Zionism uh, and the Jesuits and the so-called New World Order, this thing that people like to call the Illuminati, it does exist. Um, there is a conspiracy. This is proven. This is not a matter of question anymore. And the Jews are involved. Of course they're involved. And they're heavily involved. Are they at the very top? No one knows. God knows. But they're close to it. Mm -hmm. And it seems to be, certain historians have said that, uh, yes, in fact, they are. There was one historian, 19th century historian, I forgot his name at the moment, but he did extensive research into the private correspondence of notable people. Mm -hmm. Okay? And these, you know, these, when I'm talking about notables, I'm talking about people behind the scenes that you don't often see. Okay? These are people who attend uh, the, 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 the great uh, conventions that are never, never talked about. They're behind the castle walls. Right. They're behind, the, they're, they're in the ballrooms of the great houses. We don't see them. They're not the politicians. Some of them are. But they write to each other and he examined these letters. He examined many of them after years and he said, consequently, that the chief leader of the Freemasonic Lodge was the Black Pope of the hmm. Jesuits. Okay. Okay. Now, I have uh, my own research. Before I heard about this man, uh, uh, I, uh, I, 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 I came to certain conclusions from other sources as well who say that the Black Pope, the Jesuit Pope, is the leader of these occult societies. But we also know that the Jesuit Pope uh, uh, has to uh, uh, respond, has to report to someone in the Vatican. Mm -hmm. In the Vatican, uh, in the Vatican is the central <coughs> control. It's not the Pope who controls things. There is a, 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 an office there called the Mag Magisterium. Okay. And at the top of this Magisterium, uh, this is the leader. This is the hidden leader. Okay, so all of the occult literature says that the hand that rocks the cradle is hidden. Mm. Okay. Right. Yeah. The hand that that gives the ultimate orders is hidden. Now Blavatsky and others said that well, you know, there are seven hidden masters, but they belong to another uh, dimension. Mm. They're other dimensional entities, and you know, I'm sure that there there is such a, a realm there. Mm. Uh, we know that the gene realm exists, and we know that they have their rulers and whatnot. But what I'm talking about is an incarnate individual, mm. uh, okay, and it's most likely a man, and this man is probably most likely an hermaphrodite, a bisexual. Mm with both male and female uh, attributions, okay? Because that is at the root of the Kabbalistic God. Okay, 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 right, I see. That is at the root of the Kabbalistic God. Their deity, the one that they want to restore, and they're expecting to return as Messiah, is an androgyne, mm -hmm. a bisexual entity. If you read uh, uh, the works of... Uh, Gershom Shalom, he got to the root of this, and he attributes the root to the same cult that I've been writing about for years, the cult of Sybil in ancient Anatolia, in ancient okay. Turkey. I find that very interesting because Anatolia is where a lot of that historical Christianity, historical, a lot of history is there, that has, a lot of history goes back there, Anatolia. Uh, Anatolia. This is a this is a center 
what happened is this. Uh, if you, if, if we, we can come back to the Jesuits and the Jews and the New World Order in, in, in all things of time, I'm sure that we'll proceed to this as our interviews go. Because this is important. It's important for people to understand. What happened was this. You know, uh, the Prophet, uh, when he saw, he wrote to King uh, Khosru of the mm-hmm. Persians. And he said, if you don't convert, you're going to be responsible for the sins of the Magi. Mm-hmm. Okay? For the sins of the occult, for the sins of the magicians. Mm-hmm. You, Mr. King, <laughs> Mr. King of the Earth, you, God, is going to hold you responsible if you don't submit to Islam. Right. Okay. This was a very, very pointed and uh, purposeful letter because the occult influences that have spread all over the world and are responsible for this new world order, they all centered in Babylon. Mm. Okay. Not in Anatolia. I'll mm. tell you how they got to Anatolia. Okay. okay. This is something that people need to understand. So, uh, when's the last time you heard any of you talk about this letter to Kofu? No, I haven't. You never hear about it. No. You never hear about it. And that's exactly what Iblis wants. Hmm. <laughs> you see, let's not discuss this. I don't exist. <laughs> or if I exist, I'm just some fantastical Muslim imagination. And we all know that they're crazy. Mm-hmm. This is what he wants, especially the West to think, and the West is succumbing to this imagination. You're an idiot. You're, you're a fool in their eyes. Mm-hmm. Okay? And this is what they, this is this wind. He's controlling narrative. But the prophet wrote this letter, and I believe it was uh, one of the Mothoff leaders, uh, the Hanbao or Shafi. Uh, said that the, um, the, the the nations are corrupted because of the sins of the Magi and the lying of the initiates, hmm. the betrayal of the lovers. You remember that one? Yes, I do. Yes. Yes. Does anyone talk about this? No. No one talks about. It, you see, when I brought this up to the Alim at the board room meeting at Istak. They looked at me like I was nuts. Hmm. Okay? Now, when I saw how reluctant and how resistant they are, the Amin are, to discussing these matters, I, I gave up trying to uh, avert them. <laughs> hmm. Okay, I gave up. And I just reserved what I know to my right age and to uh, uh, forums like we are now presently enduring, okay, to people like yourself who can sit down in my little campfire and hear what this old man has to say about these things, because these things are important. Okay, so let's go back to Babylon. Uh, the Mahat, uh, I think it was Shafi or maybe Hanbal, I, I, I don't remember who said that, and the prophet indicated this Problem. Yes. It's very serious. So, what happened uh, uh, before the prophet? Before the prophet? Well, what happened before the prophet? Darius got fed up with these people because there was a there was a conglomerate of Jews and Medes who were perverting the religion, the pure monotheistic religion of Zarathustra. Remember, I I, I mentioned him before mm-hmm. in one of our earlier conversations. They have, they perverted his, uh, his uh, faith, his doctrine, and then they joined it to what Harut and Marut taught. Hmm. See? And this is, this is very clear in, 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 in the Quran. Mm-hmm. The Quran makes this very clear. Yes, very clear. And they did. All right? So, this is a reality that no one wants to discuss. No one! No, no one wants to talk about it. You have all these little, uh, Mullahs here and there talking about this gin and that gin and that gin, but nobody's talking about the organization. Right. 
of this magic. No one's talking about the organization of this magical system, which is real. Yeah, and, this is and specifically is Quran mentioning Babylon. I mean, yes. when it mentions, it specifically mentions. It specifically mentioned it. So Darius chased them out. Okay. He gave, he, he set the whip on them just like Jesus set the whip on the Jews in the temple. Hmm. Okay. Chased them out in public. Embarrassed them. Embarrassed them. They left complete loss of face. Some of the stragglers stayed behind, but most of the chief priests, these people who wear these pointed hats and like to wear scarlet purple cloaks, okay, they ran to Anatolia. Oh. And they set up shop in Pergamon. Okay. And then that magical system was seeded intact as a mi complete mystery system, mystery religions system, to Rome. Hmm. And I think it was 166 uh, uh, B.C. Hmm. Okay. So the whole thing went through. And this is it's from them that you get the title Pontifus Maximus. Okay. This That's comes right. from Babylon. Hmm. Okay. It went by means of Anatolia through the mother goddess Sibyl. Uh, uh, though that, and that gives me the, uh, uh, that cues me to the Sibylline oracles. They're the ones that prophesied the new world order. Okay. Okay. And it's, it's, it's in the, uh, it's in the records of the United States Constitutional, uh, uh, uh Congressional records too. This particular, uh, prophecy. That's where it comes from. Novus Ordum Seclorum. It mm. comes from that Sibylline prophecy. It's not new. Right, it's not it's new. Yeah, okay, okay. I get it, I get this it, is, I get it. This has been going on for a couple of days now, a couple of divine days. We're talking about 2,000 years. Yeah. So, they were, they went to Rome. They went to Rome and they then seeded their, their religion, their mystery religion, and their influence into the Roman leadership. Now, the Romans had already had their own uh, mystery religions, but Rome is a great center of accretion. Rome takes everybody, they take all their gods and bring them in. Come on in here, we're going to rule the world together. You bring your god, you bring your gods, everybody's god is okay, as long as we have the hammer. Right. Okay. That's their attitude. And these people still want to rule the world. Now, Attila came <laughs> about the four, five centuries later and taught them a lesson. And uh, uh, they all had to run away, as I mentioned previously. Then they had to reorganize. It took them about four or five hundred years during the Dark Ages to reorganize and get themselves back into uh, sufficient control of all of their resources to, again, uh, uh, attempt to control uh, all the people that they could they could get under their influence. This happens out of Venice and Florence and places like that. And they they eventually created these banking systems. And this and this was joined up with other occult influences from the Middle East. Okay, mm. because there's another center of the, the occult influence that has to do with the Golan Heights. Okay. The, the, the Jews don't want the Golden Heights just because of the oil. They want the Golden Heights because it's a mystery religion center from the ancient of days. I mean, it goes back to a, lo a long, long, there's a place there which is the center for uh, uh, Ishtar worship. So does, I know the Jews were in Babylon, so is there a relationship between Kabbalah and yes. Babylon? Yes, I, I told you before that there were Jews and Medes mixed together. Yeah. Now, some of them ran away to Anatolia, another stayed behind. And we'll talk about that group that stayed behind. The first group that went out, they, these were the richest of them. They wound up in Rome. Okay, their, their, uh, legatees wound up in Rome, uh, as a century or so later. But those who stayed behind were the poorer Jews, uh, the lesser dogs at the altar, if you will, mm. of Satan. And, when Alexander came, Alexander the Great came, he restored them to power. Right. 
Okay. Yeah. He restored them to power because there is the Lucinian mysteries from from uh, from Greece and from uh, Macedonia. They are the same. They are along the same lines hmm. as what the mystery religion of these uh, Jews and Medes was. Okay, this fire worship. Okay, they established a the fire worship. It was not uh, Zarathustra who established the fire worship. The corruptors of his religious established the fire worship. Got it. That's Got why it. you have the Olympian torch. That's why you have the uh, eternal flame in the Arlington Cemetery. That's why you have the the red light in the sacristy. Hmm. Okay, of every Catholic church. It's supposed to represent the presence of Shekinah or the Holy Spirit, if hmm. you will. Okay? It's not holy. So this fire, I've seen a lot of the cults and, and from the jinn situations that I've seen in my life, that they usually use, and I don't know if there's a relationship, but between Zoroastrian using fire and a lot of these uh, people that do magic also use fire to communicate with the jinns. Yes. Or when they're yes. communicating with the jinns, they'll use the fire at that time. So I wonder if there's a relationship between... There, there is a relationship. I, I do not understand the, uh, the electromagnetic uh, 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 inferences at the subatomic level, but there's some sort of, uh, uh, of uh, circumstances when they're pulled together with the ritual. The ritual has to, in, uh, has to, has to include some sort of verbalization, some mantra, in conjunction with the fire, and this then creates the egregory, which then opens the portal. Okay, and it are they like the summoning? Time. Are they like summoning? Like uh, based upon my limited understanding, it it seems like they do some sort of summoning of or calling to uh, of these jinns uh, through the fire, and then I guess the jinn appears. Or I mean, is that yeah. something? They, they will use the uh, they will use the fire or the water uh, the, the, in in the water if they use the water it's it's called the scryer hmm. they will use the fire or they will use the smoke to manifest themselves because right. these are subtle bodies right some right. of the less some of the lesser gin cannot take on a physical body yes. some of the greater gin can do that right the more subtle gin at the lower levels of magic and that's usually what you're experiencing. At the level, uh, at the community level, hmm. it's a low level magic. Right. And the gene will then manifest there. Sometimes they'll manifest in the wind. They bring a cold, icy wind. Hmm. Or, uh, the, you know, the smoke or water or crystal ball. If you have a crystal, they can manifest in the reflections of light in the crystal. Okay. This sort of thing. If you stand in front of the mirror for any length of time, and you do certain incantations, you can see the jinn manifest. Mm. Okay. This happens all the time. This is common. This is not uh, anything that's secret. Yeah, yeah. At, at, at these upper levels, at the levels that we're One of the things that, uh, that I do when somebody has a jinn, I ask them to stand in front of the mirror and read Fatiha. And as yeah. they're reading Fatiha in the mirror, looking at their own eyes, they become scared. If they have a jinn in them, because it's reacting and they're looking at themselves, and there's something about the they eyes and they will see the jinn. They will see it. They, 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 I mean, I've seen uh, like this one lady. I told her, you know, go to the mirror and read Fatiha seven times. She started screaming with whatever she was seeing. You yes. know, so yeah, see, Subhanallah. It's, it's, it yeah. Can be frightening. Uh, but these 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 jinn, they have no power over you unless Allah has given them license. And they only give, Allah only gives license for two reasons. One, to try your faith. Okay. You know, he can, he can have a jinn beat you just to, just to test your faith to see if you're going to turn. Mm -hmm. Okay. Or, uh, uh, or because you, you have already turned. Mm -hmm. See. You know, if you, if you've already turned your back on Allah, then Allah turns his back on you. And you do that frequently enough, Allah turns his back on you forever. Hmm. You see. And uh, the, this is also in the scripture, both in the, the Quran and in the Bible. So I hope that explains a little bit about this relationship. 
Yeah, definitely. Between the Jews and the magicians. And it goes back to Babylon. After Alexander... Uh, so I guess power. studying and understanding Jewish history in Babylon is uh, important subject. Yes, it is. It, it, it is. Uh, most people don't know anything about this. The, the Jews who remained behind in Babylon, those who did not return, so I wonder, you know, the saying of the prophet, it always kind of puzzles me looking at the geopolitical situation today. But the prophet talks about Jews in Asfahan, in Iran. Ah, yes. So is this somehow like the return to Babylon or uh, or or is there some relationship between Babylon and the the Jews in Asfahan? Uh, I, I, I don't know. I don't know about that. I, that's a region of the earth that I'm not I do know that there is a strong Jewish contingent in Iran to this day, yeah. and that they are actually the power behind the ostensible power. Uh, so, uh, and we can talk about the Ishmaeli and the Shiita influence at, at, at another time. Uh -huh. But uh -huh. all of that, all of that stems from Babylon, and all of it stems from the teachings of Harut and Marut. Mm. How these uh, these influences uh, entered the Ummah and the Ulama primarily through pseudo Sufi cults. Mm. Okay. Um, yeah, the, I have actually had a uh, uh, a sheikh tell me that you know I was I was in Azhar I was studying in Azhar and uh, so I felt uh, some sort of presence. Okay, which w now I understand was a jinn, and but I went to a um, a Sufi sheikh, and he said to me that that's some great saint uh, that has come to you, and uh, and so you know a lot of them they get fooled by thinking these jinns are some you know friends of Allah or some saint that has come to them, and. Uh, There's a narration in which after the Prophet, Prophet Sallallahu after the conquest of Mecca, he tells Ali, go and break such and such. These are the bigger idols, like the uh, of Lat and Uzza. And, and Ali went there and instead of, he found by the idol a, like a, a jinn, a black, uh, you know, a, a black figure that, and, and, and then, and then he asks the Prophet, he goes back and he says, well, but there's this, person by the idol and the prophet says that's the one you have to kill yes <laughs> so it's you know it's not just the idol it's it's the it's the jinn with the idol and yes. and and yes. i guess that answers a part of the question of why paganism is so important because i guess there's some love between 
these jinns and idols or or something of this nature that uh, they really like to bring human beings back to the worship of idols it seems if you find if you if you if you, if you find the if you if you examine the nature of the actual idol the wood or the stone you find that there's always a hollow somewhere some of them are completely hollow mm. you know, and the jinn actually live in them mm. okay they they live in these things and they they are they are um, they are instructed to manifest from time to time, uh, 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 so as to mislead the humans. Because mm. the Id idols is what brings the humans to hell. Idolatry brings the humans to hell. Oh, so it's a portal to hell. Right, it's a portal. It's because like bring, yeah, yeah, that's right. Instead of instead of following Shita, they're following the idol. They're worshiping the idol yeah. instead of worshiping Allah. Okay, so. Uh, yeah, they're, they're gonna, the, the non-Muslim jinn are going to learn the idol. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Okay. And some of your, uh, unredeemed jinn, those who not necessarily hate Allah or the kingdom, some of, you know, the, you have jinn who just, you know, they just live. They, they don't think about these things. Yeah. They just enjoy, you know, whatever, whatever life they have. Uh, if they can get attention, you know, they're, they're cunning creatures. They enjoy, they, 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 they enjoy attention and they enjoy trickery. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, sometimes you, you get a jinn. He doesn't necessarily know anything about Allah. He doesn't necessarily care about religion, but he loves to have fun with humans. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, you know, it's not much else going to do or hurt mm -hmm. you. And uh, some of them, they, they, they love to have sex. They love the, the physical sensation. So, and these are not necessarily jinn who, uh, who are satanic jinn. They're just jinn having a good time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I've it's actually, like I've actually yeah. seen that and, and understand it quite well. That, uh, because of, of certain conversations I've had with some jinns, I don't know if they were Muslims, but they claimed to be Muslims, but I think the information was correct because it's verified through many sources. And that is that their, their sense of like, if we eat, we have so many taste buds, so a big variety, right? Of, of like tastes. They don't have that. When we have intimacy, we enjoy intimacy at a level that they don't have that. So, so their, their, their life is very bland compared to human beings. And so what they do is they like to connect to the brain, to the yeah. brain waves at yeah. some level. And uh, they're able to, at that point, uh, when a human being is doing a certain act or, or let's say they're drunk, or they're able to enjoy a little bit of that enjoyment of eating or, yeah. or intimacy. And, and, and they like that, and they want that, and they want that human experience of, of the, of eating something or, or, or ha having intimacy. And, and, uh, there is even a saying of the Prophet that says exactly that, that it's not the person eating, it's the jinn that's eating. You know? And, uh, but I, I, I asked a jinn, jinni, a female jinn once, uh, that I was reading Quran over in, and anyway, that's a longer story, but um, but this is, you know, why are you here? I'm here because I want to enjoy what this person's eating, you yes. know? And and, yes. and, and the, the, the jinn went as far as telling me a joke, the, you know, that when human beings are in a restaurant and they're looking at a menu, they can't even decide what food to eat. They're look, they, like, their, their variety is so big, they can't even, it's like, they, they're like, well, she was saying you guys are so stupid you can't even decide what to eat with the menu. That's how many taste, <laughs> that's how many different taste buds you have. There, there, there are common jinn sinners just like there are common Muslim sinners. Okay? Yeah. They're just enjoying what they can enjoy. And this is one of the reasons that we need to have Allah's refuge. Okay? That's right. So that these influences do not uh, have a negative control or a negative influence on our thinking or on our lives in general, okay? Uh, whether they be Muslim or non-Muslim jinn, it doesn't matter, okay? There's a barrier, there's a separation, 
And if we allow ourselves to be open, we open those portals, it's not our, it's not Allah's fault, it's our fault. Mm. And this has everything to do with the branding that we were talking about yesterday. When you live under a particular branding, those portals are open. The jinn have a field day with you. Yeah. Okay. And uh, part of the branding, part of the marking, is the emotional illnesses that people are experiencing. Okay. I'm not talking about physical illnesses. Yes, there, that there can be that too. But most of them are emotional illnesses. Mm. Okay. And, and this is because of the jinn influence. The jinn influence will do this, and it creates a stress. It creates stress, and be, that's because people are living under the false idea that they're serving God. They're not. Mm. Okay, you can pray five times a day, then you go to the mosque, and at the top of the mosque is this cross and the crescent. This is a sigil from, this, from the enemy. It's a sigil of an ancient Sumerian religion mm. honoring a false god and his wife. Okay. Mm. <laughs> So, uh, this is, uh, the, uh, you know, this, uh, so, so when, when I saw this and I uh, came to understand, I tried to tell people, I tried to warn people about this. Maybe I tell a hundred people and only one person gets it. Hmm. Only one person gets it. And he said, well, what, 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 one young man asked me, he said, what, what shall I do? I mean, where can I, where else can I go for dinner? I said, look, you just ask Allah for refuge. Even when you enter the mosque. Hmm. Okay. Because, and, and this was the same, this, was, this fellow was one of many who complained. He said, every time I go to Juma, I fall asleep during the Kutba. Hmm. <laughs> it's because there's no spirit there. There's no true spirit of inspiration. There's no true spirit of Hidayah. It's all legalism. Thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. Nobody's <laughs> saying what to do, okay? Yeah. You know, it's all, you must do this, you must do that. My God, there was a time when the, when, when, when the ulama would go by and if your finger wasn't raised at a certain, they'd chop it off. Mm. This is crazy, this is bad, this is demonic, okay? And these are Muslims doing this. Yeah. And they're totally, totally unaware. Because they're cut off from Peter, but they don't think so. They think exactly the opposite. You see? So, and, and so we're living in, in a day now where good is evil and evil is good. Everything's been turned upside down. Well, wow. upside down, the reverse. So, Allahu uh, Akbar. I think uh, okay. we're at a good point for today, inshallah, and we okay. can continue, inshallah, tomorrow. Um, and, uh, Dr. Umar, do you want to say, uh, any last words before we leave, uh, today? Um, nothing in particular. I just want to thank uh, dear Sister Miriam, uh, for putting us in touch. Uh, okay. Sister Miriam was a lady, she's hiding out someplace in England now, I forgot where she is. I, I, I met her, she was a, a student of Imran Hussein in Malaysia. Mashallah. I met her and her Mashallah. husband. Uh, they're estranged now, but she's living in England, and we recently got back in touch, and uh, she put me in touch with you. And mm -hmm. I think this is a wonderful thing, and I and I just uh, ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala to watch over her and her children, and to grant mm -hmm. them the refuge and the inspiration, and provide for their every need. Um, Allah. Inshallah, I ask everyone that's listening to me and Dr. Umar to um, please pray for us too. Inshallah. Okay, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Take care. Make sure to subscribe today and make sure you like and make sure you leave your comments and ideas. Zakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum. أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله